It's my distinct pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Genevieve Neil Perry, who earned her bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College and obtained her MD, PhD in pharmacology from Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and UMDNJ. She completed her OBGYN residency and fellowship training in reproductive endocrinology and infertility at the Beth Israel Medical Center and Montefiore Medical Center, respectively. After fellowship, she joined the faculty at Einstein College of Medicine in OBGYN and neuroscience. While at Einstein, she served at, as the REI Division Research and Fellowship Director, as well as Associate Dean for Diversity and Mentoring. In 2015, Dr. Neil Perry joined the Department of OBGYN at the University of Washington, where she directed the Division of REI and opened the Cancer and Reproduction Unit at the Seattle Cancer Center Alliance where she helped ensure people diagnosed with cancer had fertility and menopausal care. In April 2020, Dr. Neil Perry was appointed as Robert A. Ross, Distinguished Professor and Chair of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. In this role, she oversees more than 90 faculty and 40 residents and fellows, and more than a $20 million research program. Dr. Neil Perry is a national leader in women's health research and reproductive endocrinology. Her research program has focused on environmental and nutritional modifiers of fertility and the menopausal experience. And her leadership roles have included serving as a NIH Council and Study Section member, Vice President for the Endocrine Society, and the Vice President of Diversity and Structural Change for the Society of Reproductive Investigation. Dr. Neil Perry is passionate about faculty and learner academic development and equipping faculty and learners with the tools that will allow them personal success in those areas that they are most passionate about. Now, is it my imagination or is it getting off near? I'm sure you're as excited as I am to learn of advances in the biology of menopause from Dr. Neil Perry. Dr. Neil Perry. Thank you for that introduction. Can you all hear me okay? Well, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I've never been in uh, Madison. Actually, I've never been in the state of Wisconsin. So I was pleased to arrive and the sun was out. It is so beautiful. And I said, why did it take me so long to get here? So I'm really happy to be here today. And um, what I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about menopause. I feel like it's an area that many of our learners don't know as much about because we don't see as many patients or take care of as many patients. And also just talk to you about what we understand about the biology, which has really increased over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, and about some new and emerging um, treatment that is specifically for hot flashes. And um, that's related to how we understand the biology. Um, I also hope to end at the um, uh, to end with uh, some discussion about my own journey. So I think when I was a resident, when I was a junior faculty, I would hear people talk, and I wonder how did they get to where they are. What are some of the things that are key um, to to success, and you know how might I think about my own career? So I have to read this. Um, I have a financial relationship with the um, Scientific Advisory Board for Stellis Pharmaceutical. And I will discuss um, some unlabeled, unapproved drugs because these are, these are the new drugs that are on the horizon and that will actually, I think, be a game changer for how we manage menopausal symptoms. So my goal today is to explain the basic biology of the menopause, to explain the role of candy neurons, in a generation of hot flashes. I'm curious how many people are familiar with uh, candy neurons? One per two people? Okay, so this is gonna be new. Um, and then um, explain the role of NK3 receptor antagonists. These are tachykinin um, receptor um, antagonists and how we um, can potentially use them to manage um, hot flashes. Um, the other thing I want to say is that the data that's um, reflected um, in terms of the clinical data are people who I identified as women and who were born with ovaries. All right, so the physiology and a natural history of menopause. So the definition of menopause is the absence of menses for 12 consecutive months, right? It's a retrospective diagnosis. Um, you cannot do a random FSH or check a random AMH and define menopause. 
when we talk about natural menopause, we're not talking about people who've had a hysterectomy. Um, and it can be, um, and it's really important to also know that you can't, it's, it may be difficult in people who've had a long standing history of amenorrhea. The typical range in terms of when um, it happens is between 46 to 52, um, and the median age is about 51. There are some racial and ethnic differences in terms of this, these, um, these ages. Hispanic women and black women may have an earlier menopause than Caucasian and um, Asian women. So the road to menopause, you know, it's, it's hot in here. And I literally felt that way when I came in here, just, just so that you all know, I thought I have to take my clothes off. Um, in terms of the road uh, to menopause, there, you know, you have your uh, early reproductive age, and then you have your early transition. When you start to see some variability in the menstrual cycle, you may see about seven days, but you have less than 60 days of amenorrhea. Typically, the median age is about 47, and a range can be one to 10 years. Then there's the late transition when you see greater than 60 days of amenorrhea. The median age is about 49, and the duration for this is usually shorter. It's about two. The actual diagnosis of menopause in terms of median age in the United States is about um, 51.4, and remembering that and what it means. So what is a hot flash? It's typically, if you talk to patients, it's described as a one to five minute um, experience of feeling hot. And that heat sensation is different from if you're exercising where you have total body sweating, the heat sensation and the sweating is really from the hips up. And so you see a flushing and a hot sensation is you know, generally in, in the above the neck and the face. It can be associated with um, profuse uh, sweating, vasodilation, which is why we call it a hot flush. Um, and it can be associated with chills. It can be associated with anxiety, um, palpitations, and, and just really people can feel just awful. And as someone who experienced this, it was a little odd to be in a room with someone in a meeting and then all of a sudden start sweating. You know, people are thinking like, well, what's going on with her? Why is she feeling, why is she so sweaty? It's a really uncomfortable um, experience to go through. So when we talk about um, hot flashes, we generally think about it as it's related to a loss of estrogen. But remind, I'm gonna remind you that it actually happens before people actually have a loss of ovarian function. So we think it's related to changes in the slope, slope changes in estrogen. So it's not just a loss of estrogen, but it's the change in from going from a very high level to a very low level. And I, I'll talk a little bit more about that biology. In terms of hot flashes, how long do they last? Some people it's six months. Now we actually have data that says it's typically on average about seven years. And for some groups, it can be more than 10 to 12 years. So their ratio, again, and ethnic differences in hot flashes. Uh, for women of color, they can begin in their late 30s, early 40s, and they can extend for 15 years, 10 to 15 years. So it's really important to listen to your patients and not just dismiss what they're saying and, um, and understand uh, that, that biology. There are mild, moderate, and severe um, hot flashes. When we talk about mild to moderate, it's generally less than um, five. It's not um, associated with sweating. It may not be as disruptive, but moderate to severe, people can experience this uh, more than eight times a day. It can be disruptive at night so that they're losing sleep and they're tired in the day. They're having a hard time with cognition and many other uh, things that are associated with a loss of sleep. When we, when we think about who's affected, it's generally 75% of US women. That's a lot of people. And so you can, what other disease process do you know or disruptive medical problem that affects 75% of any particular group? Um, in terms of those who experience a moderate to severe, it's more than 30%. We already talked about um, the duration and, um, one third of women can, ex can report more than 10 hot flashes a day. So it can be quite a burden. There are things that make it worse. Um, some of the things that I love are spicy food, red wine, <laughs> um, smoking, if someone is a smoker, uh, it may be related to um, the metabolism of estrogen, caffeine use, certainly stressful situations can trigger um, hot flashes. 
Why is it important? Because we know it affects quality of life, but we also know that individuals who have lots of hot flashes also an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and, and, uh, and medical problems that will um, result in morbidity that can have an impact on their longevity. So are there genetic, genetic variances that contribute to hot flashes? So since I'm asking you the question, you're probably thinking yes. Um, well, there are things that affect um, the neurogenergic system, um, particularly serotonergic system, the histaminergic system, the adrenergic system, um, the neurogenergic and tachykinins, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Specifically, there are genetic um, modifications in how estradiol is metabolized. So your 17 beta hydroxysteroid, some of the SIPs. And this results in lower levels of estradiol and higher levels of estrone, which don't have the same affinity to the estrogen receptor. And so we think that this may be involved in some individuals having more hot flashes. Uh, estrogen receptor um, uh, modification in terms of responsiveness to estrogens, serotonin receptor transporters, and specifically in women of color, um, the, ser the SSRIs may not be as effective because of modifications in how um, serotonin is metabolized. Uh, the tachykinin receptor, and this receptor is a G-couple receptor that actually responds to neurokinin. And norokinin is one of the neurotransmitters that's produced by the candy neuron. And I'm gonna get into a little bit more detail there because that's kind of where all the new um, data is. There are actually some people who have fewer hot flashes and those are people who have modifications in UDP and um, potentially CYP34. So what is the black box behind hot flashes? I already told you it's not just a loss of estrogen because we know it's variability in estrogen. So what is it that contributes to hot flashes? Well, we do know that um, estrogen is involved in some way because there have been studies where they show that if you give someone, um, if you give them estrogen, you can reduce hot flashes. If you give them placebo and then cross them over to estrogen, it improves hot flashes. So again, I said, it's not the loss of estrogen only. So I'm gonna show you why we know this. So this study is, um, was done by Nanette Santoro back in 1996. And it was actually a, a game changer in terms of how we thought about hot flashes. Cause we thought that the elevation in FSH and um, hot flashes were solely related to estrogen deprivation. And what she showed in this study was that in perimenopausal um, individuals, you actually have elevated FSH but we did not see elevated estrone, which is a metabolite of estrogen. Excuse me, we did not see lower levels of, est of estrone, which is a metabolite of estrogen. So that kind of rocked things a bit because now we know that it's not just estrogen alone that's triggering um, these hot flashes. So the knowledge gaps, why do they occur? So there, uh, about 15 to 20 years ago, um, uh, Naomi Rance, who's a pathologist, was looking at the brains of postmenopausal and premenopausal women. And what she found was that there were these cells that were located in these neurons that are located in the hypothalamus, um, specifically the median eminence, that were different if you were premenopausal versus postmenopausal. So in the premenopausal um, individuals, you see these cells and, and you see these, um, this peptide here. You don't see nearly as much as you do in the postmenopausal individuals. She did a similar study using primates and she was able to recapitulate what she saw in, in the postmenopausal um, women in younger animals that were um, intact or oophorectomized. It took about 15 years for us to know what these neurons were. And these are the neurons that are called candy neurons. So these neurons um, are unique in that they express several neurotransmitters. They express kispeptin. How many people are familiar with kispeptin? Not many, okay. So kispeptin is actually a neurotransmitter that's excitatory in nature. And what we've shown is that it's actually important for um, the generation of LH release and LH um, surges in, in young reproductive individuals. Um, it's in these um, neurons. And, it's, and there's also norokinin B and there's dynorphin. The thing of interest is the norokinin B specifically. 
So norokinin B interacts with the tachykinin um, receptor, the um, NK3 receptor, which can be associated with mood changes. And we've since found that it's associated with hot flashes. So what's so special about it? Okay. Okay, so what's special about it is they sit in the hypothalamus, they project to um, neurons that interface with GnRH neurons, and they can also affect, they're also affected by estrogen um, feedback. So understanding this, we did some experiments in the lab to try to understand whether neurokinin um, receptor agonist, meaning something that stimulates the receptor, will trigger hot flashes. And the way that we did this was with uh, mice, and we created something called a... Um, uh, a, a thermocline. And so it was like a board that was cool on one side and hot on the other. And what we did was we put mice on this, um, on this board and then we're able to monitor their behavior. So we would give them a, a drug called Senktide, and this is an agonist, which we know um, where we were proposing um, actually activated these warm sensing neurons in the, in the, um, in the hypothalamus. And then we looked at the body temperature of the mice, and we also looked at their behavior. So if they're, they become hot, they're going to move over to the cool side, okay? If they become hot, their tails also um, release, um, um, like their temperature increases. So this is a study that we did. We looked at their tails, we looked at their behavior. And so here is an example of um, what happened. The vehicle, you see the mice stayed on the warmer side, which is on the left side here. And the mice that we gave the scent tie to and also capsaicin, which also triggers hot flashes, moved over to the cool side. So it was a physiological study showing that the um, scent tie, the, uh, the neurokinin agonist can actually trigger hot flashes in mice. So you may be saying, okay, mice are mice, who cares? Um, what about humans? Well, what's happening in humans? Oh, the other thing is we showed that the uh, core body temperature increased. The blue are our control. The green are our animals um, treated with the same kind, looking at the tail um, uh, temperature. And we saw that that increased in the animals who moved over to the cool side. All right. So what about an NKBN agonist in, in um, premenopausal people? Well, will that trigger a hot flash? Well, that study was actually done. Um, and it was done back in um, uh, 2015 um, by a group in, in uh, Great Britain. And what they did was they had five, um, they had 10 participants and um, they either were um, treated with a uh, vehicle or they were triggered with um, NKB ag agonist sentai. And what they showed was that these people who received the sentai actually had hot flashes. Not only did they have hot flashes, they also had um, an increase in their, um, in terms of heart rate, and um, they also um, reported more anxiety. So we're able to show that in, in humans as well. So what is the current model in terms of understanding the etiology of hot flashes? What we think is that um, there's a complex interplay between the central nervous system and uh, the peripheral nervous system. And specifically, we think that there is an alteration in the way that these neurons are responding to their estrogen environment, and that will actually trigger the neurokine, these candy neurons, they become hyperactive. And so they, they become hyperactive, hypertrophied, they stimulate each other, and then they stimulate the neurons in the um, thermoregulatory zone that triggers hot flashes. So essentially, the thermoneutral um, zone, which is typically very narrow, is, which is why we're able to regulate well, is shifted because of these changes in the biology of these neurons. Um, importantly, um, we also know that serotonin works and, and, and the SNRIs work because these neurons are probably affecting those neurons as well. So what we know about uh, the system is that these neurons are interconnected. The absence or change in um, estrogen will modify how they behave. And then these neurons um, activate other areas that can trigger, the, that trigger hot flashes. So what are some of the emerging um, therapies that are kind of in kind of on their way in terms of being available for patients who cannot use hormones to treat their hot flashes or who won't use hormones? 
Well, they're NK3 receptor antagonists. And these are um, antagonists that actually disrupt the neurokine and B receptor <laughs> pathway. Um, they are non-hormonal, so they don't have the same um, concerns in terms of uterine pathology and breast pathology. Um, there are two that are now um, in study and in either phase two or phase three um, studies, and, that fez and that's phezolinotent, which is a NK3 receptor antagonist, and elizanotent, which is an NK1 and 3 receptor antagonist. So I'm going to show you a little bit of data there. Um, so what's the scoop with phezolinotent? Um, there was uh, actually a series of studies, Skylight 1 through 3. It's a double-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-center um, phase 3 study. Um, and the inclusion um, criteria is 40 to 65 women, uh, excuse me, 40 to 65 year old women, um, included um, individuals from the United, United States, Canada, and about eight countries in Europe. And um, the cold primary efficacy points were the volume or number of hot flashes and the severity of hot flashes. And uh, secondary um, outcomes, uh, in some of the other studies we're looking at sleep and, um, and, and also looking at um, some uh, quality of life um, issues. So the study is designed so that you have um, patients who are one-on-one -on -one randomized after screening to either placebo, two different doses, 30 and 45, it's a single day dose of treatment. Um, we, the study, they were looked at over the 12 weeks of their uh, initial um, treatment, and then the placebo groups were re-randomized to either 30 or 45 um, milligrams of phezolinotin. So what did they show? Um, one of the things that I think is important about this study, as well as um, the, um, uh, the uh, next study I'll show you, is that it had a really diverse group of patients. And that's not very common because a lot of clinical studies is primarily composed of, of individuals who are of Caucasian descent. Um, and this particular study and the next one had about 15% of um, individuals from diverse backgrounds, which I think is important when we think about how we will uh, counsel patients about the effectiveness of a uh, treatment um, for them. Uh, the, you can see the data here, the groups were fairly similar. And what they were able to show is that um, within, pretty much within a week, there was a significant reduction in hot flashes. And you don't see that with any of the SRIs. Um, you can see that with estrogen, so that was nice. And um, what they also showed um, was that there was, the both doses work um, quite well. And you can see that um, relative to placebo, it was which placebo is power and just suggestion for almost anything. Um, the uh, treatment actually reduced um, hot flashes to about 50 to 60 percent, which is great. Um, they also, uh, like I said, extended the study to 52 weeks and they looked at um, hot flashes. They showed that hot flashes continue to reduce and stabilize to about a mean um, change of about eight. Um, they show that uh, the uh, severity um, was reduced. They show that the effectiveness was similar across um, all of the different groups, um, including obese individuals who can have more hot flashes, as well as um, individuals of color. And they also showed an improvement in sleep. So this was this is great. Um, you know, we're still waiting to see whether um, uh, you know whether there's. Um, any uh, FDA approval, but this could really be a game changer. And when I really think about patients, I think about our breast cancer survivors um, who really don't have great options. I think about our patients who have um, thrombogenic disorders where if they're experiencing hot flashes, they don't really have options. And so this could be a, a real game changer. So elizinotent um, is also uh, this uh, NK3, 1 and, 3, uh, 1 and 3 receptor antagonist. And it, the study was fairly similar um, in terms of the, the inclusion criteria and some of the um, co-primary co endpoints. Uh, the design um, similar as well, except for they had a, a total of four different doses relative to placebo. Uh, again, uh, the age range, this group was um, probably a little bit older than the um, phezolinotent group. And, you know, that's interesting because uh, the biggest burden of hot flashes is typically in a young, slightly younger group. Um, and again, they, they had more diversity than what some of the other studies um, we typically see. 
And what they um, have been able to show in their phase 2B study is that um, this um, lenzenotent actually reduces hot flashes, and it does that within um, 4 to 12 weeks, um, both the severity and frequency of them. And they also show that um, the quality of life of, of those affected was also improved. Um, so this is promising and uh, really looking forward to see where this goes as well. So conclusions for both of these drugs is that um, both of them improved the frequency and severity of um, hot flashes in those affected, and this was the primary goal. Um, if there were no major safety signals, meaning that um, there were no major medical um, issues related to it. The most common um, symptoms of the Fezzolinitin group was um, some people had headaches, um, some people were a little bit more somnolent, and that was true for the elanzanotin um, group as well. With elanzanotin, they also, there was a higher um, incidence of, of diarrhea that probably related to the NK1 effects of the drug. So here is what the pathology is. That we, This is what we think is going on now with um, hot flashes. You have these candy neurons that in the presence of estrogen are not active. They, they are just kind of quiescence, kind of doing their bit that they're supposed to do. But then in the absence of estrogen, you know, they're given free reign, right? It's like being a parent and you leave your kids at home. And when you come back, things are a mess, right? And this is essentially what happens with these um, neurons that they're no longer constrained by estrogen. Um, and that they're allowed to kind of become overexcited. And as a result, um, they're causing trouble. Things that we still have yet to really understand. Remember, I told you that there was some improvement in sleep. So we're not entirely sure that it's only related to a loss in um, a change in hot flashes. There may be some other things that are going on that we need to understand about the biology of sleep disruption and menopause. Um, Anybody who's menopausal, almost anybody, will tell you that they don't, if it, they, they're gaining weight and the weight is typically distributed around um, the waist. Uh, and, uh, you know, even though they eat less, they exercise the same, they just seem to have a change in their body type. And so we know that um, uh, the menopause itself changes in metabolism. And there are some preliminary data that suggests that this neurokinin um, 3 antagonist may actually have some benefits in terms of weight as well. So that's still yet to be seen. And uh, personally, we'll be looking forward to that. Um, so there have been a lot of people involved in um, my research. I've only given you a little bit of taste of some of the things that I've done, but certainly um, appreciate all the people who've made it happen. I've had a lot of fellows involved in my research um, and a lot of people who just um, kind of love to do it. And so, you know, I've been able to um, really ride on their coattails because they've helped me kind of get there and certainly have had uh, quite a bit of funding to help me get there. So without the funding, I wouldn't be able to do that. So I'm going to switch um, gears and I'm going to flip through these um, slides really quickly. Uh, and at any point, if you have questions, please don't um, hesitate to um, ask. So, you know, I, I, how many people know about an individual development plan? All right, so there's a few people. I am the hugest proponent of this. And, and the reason is, is I think it causes us to stop, think about what we want to do with our careers and rather kind of be a, Kind of a, you know you have those little uh those little floats on a you know one of those uh little in a pool little waves and you're just floating along instead of doing that just floating along really being an active participant in terms of what happens with your career so uh you know i have to start with this slide and i say what do you know what do i have in common with these two people and i'm going to tell you what some of you are thinking maybe she played basketball no didn't play basketball. Um, some of you are like, well, they're both black, but so is she. Yeah, that's true, but that's not really what I have in common with them. Um, what I have in common with them is I love what I do. I truly love what I do. And both of these people love what they, what they did, Tony Morris and, and Michael Jordan. Um, and so my disclaimer here is I love what I do. So that's my bias. Um, I always uh, really think about Eleanor Roosevelt because one of the things she said, that really resonated with me was the future belongs to those who believe in their dreams. And so I've dreamt about places I could go. And I always think about how I can help others dream and, and do the things that only they can do. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. Um, 
just so that you get a little bit more context about um, kind of where I am now and where I came from. First generation college, um, there are no real community um, role models um, in my um, area who've gone to college, who've been doctors to even talk to them to understand kind of what does that path look like. Um, where I grew up, there were a lot of teenage pregnancies. So that was a huge life changer for people. And so I needed to make sure I avoided that crowd. Um, my parents were not able to really pay for college. We were working middle class. And if one of them lost a job, that was that changed our you know our kind of life trajectory um, significantly. Um, so there were a lot of questions for me about how do I get there? You know, I watched TV and some, many of you in this room are way too young to know this, but there's some of you who um, know that um, there was a, a show called St. Elsewhere's and um, Denzel Washington, many of you know who he is. He was actually a doctor on this show. And that was actually the first time I'd seen someone who was black as a doctor. And that was something I was like, I'd like to be a doctor. And you know, how do you get there? Um, I, I still remember when I was um, in middle school, I think one of the, the school guidance counselors said to me, you should be a secretary. That's what people like you are good at. And not saying you should be a doctor or you should be a lawyer or you should be a business manager. So having you know people around me telling me that there are things that I couldn't do. So I had to be able to rise above that and think beyond that. And so I felt like I had a world of worries on my shoulder and really felt like this. Um, I really worried a lot about if I made mistakes, would that affect other people behind me or other people who look like me? Um, you know, I often felt like I was being held accountable for the things that people who look like me did. Um, you know, I, one time I had someone say to me, and, and it was even the fact that they said this to me just speaks to kind of the environment, was they wanted me to explain why um, Black people didn't want to go to college. And it was the most, probably the most ignorant thing I've ever heard in my life because that wasn't true, right? Because there are financial situations that prevent people from achieving and, and having opportunities to do things. But the idea that this person thought that people that they had control over this situation, but they chose not to relieve themselves of it really um, said a lot. Um, and certainly imposter sy syndrome, I don't belong here. You know, being afraid to raise my voice when I felt something was wrong or that there are other opportunities, um, other ways to solve a problem. And, um, you know, and certainly was afraid to ask for help. I had to learn how to ask for help because I was worried that if I, if I asked for help, that people would think that I didn't belong and I wasn't worthy. And so learning, and learning how to help, ask for help is such an important skill for career development and career success. And that was really important for me. Um, Winston Churchill, I live by these, the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity, the optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. And that's I'm um, uh, optimist. And so I can see the positive through uh, most situations. So in terms of what my career um, has looked like, um, I uh, did my residency in New York as was um, described. Uh, my mentor is Nanette Santoro, and this is a funny story. So when I met her, um, it was in New York, and um, it was at the OB, New York OB Society meeting. And um, my chair was like, oh, you should meet her. She's so wonderful. You guys are going to get along great. So I met her, and I'm talking to her, and I don't realize I'm following her, and I followed her into the bathroom. <laughs> trying to talk to her about my research interests. And Nanette was so gracious. She just continued to talk to me over the stall. Um, but, you know, that speaks to, you know, the, the importance of mentorship and, and people who are involved um, in your um, career. Uh, so I did go on to do my um, research, uh, my uh, fellowship with Nanette. And um, I actually had my first grant as a, a fellow. And it was a national um, grant through the SRM and SREI. Um, I stayed on at Einstein um, to really develop my career, had my first grant, uh, went on to, um, to the University of Washington, uh, had the opportunity to do some great things to the other UW, um, and, and then um, have, you know, now at um, the University of North Carolina. And again, just really um, having the opportunity to grow. So have I done it all? Um, 
I'm simply, you know, I used to look like that. Um, no, not, not at all. I'm not a superwoman. Um, really, as I said, I'm a glass is half full, not half empty. Um, I've had a network of, of mentors. So no person is an island. Um, you know, your peers can be your mentors. You have a professional career mentor, scholarly life uh, mentors. And I am a believer that everybody needs more than one mentor. I say a mentee-mentor relationship is not monogamous, okay? And that people provide different resources for you, for you at different points in your life, and you need different things at different points in your life. Um, I've had sponsors. There is a difference between a mentor and a sponsor, and I'm happy to talk about that. So I do believe that mentors were critical for my um, continued success, and I've had a whole host of them. There's a picture of Nanette and Ann. Um, Nadine Katz, who is the um, uh, CEO or the um, Chief Medical Officer at Einstein now. Um, Vicki um, Freeman, she was a um, Dean in, uh, for graduate studies. She really helped me when I was a, an Associate Dean in terms of thinking about things. And then there's this uh, man, his name is uh, Mer Erwin Murkatz, and he was my chair um, for many years. And I actually left um, Montefiore when he um, retired. Uh, he, he was a force of, uh, of a person, and he really pushed us to think outside the box and to think about what we could be. And when I think about him and just the way he was, I think about a book um, by Dr. Seuss, and it was a book, uh, all the things, all the places you could go. And that was what he really instilled in, in many of us. He, um, from his cohort of, of faculty, um, one is a chair now at WashU. Um, Nanette is a chair at, um, at University in um, Denver. I'm at um, UNC. We have someone who's at um, NYU. I mean, he, like, talk about a legacy. Um, this, this guy created one. He was a fantastic um, chair. He was, he, he, he could be scary. Um, and then there's Robert Steiner. I did a lot of the work with the, um, the, the thermocline with him. And he was really the reason that I went to UW. He invited me to give a scientific talk. And he had a whole different plan. Um, and little did I know uh, that was his plan. And, and David Eschenbach, who was the chair at, um, at UW, who, again, was a fantastic mentor, um, as well as sponsor. Um, and, uh, and, and then Judy, um, who was at, um, who also uh, mentored me. So I, I have these things here, and I'm going to try to get through them quickly, but mentors have many, many roles, and I, I want you all to, as mentees, to have a look at this. Um, it's really important to know that, um, you know, they can provide different levels of um, mentoring for you, but really important is what the mentee should do, because we talk a lot about what the mentor should do. We don't talk a lot about mentees. The best mentees are ones who are who take initiative and they're proactive. Um, you communicate your agenda ahead of your meeting, not um, at the time of your meeting. So this gives your mentor a chance to think about what it is that they need to do to, in order to help you. Be clear about your goals and expectations. Reflect before and after that meeting. Um, follow up with questions. Look for opportunities to teach the mentor. We're all here because we love to learn. And so we, we, and we really um, love when our mentees are teaching us stuff and, and pushing us to think about things in different ways. I already talked about it's not monogamous, always be organized and thoughtful and seek critical feedback. One of the biggest, um, I think, things that I've seen people fail with is that they don't want you to tell them that you can be better. They only wanna hear that you're perfect, that you're great, that everybody's a winner and everybody gets a, a medal. And that is just not the life that we live. You, the only way you grow is by getting that constructive feedback and having someone who's going to tell you when you can be better. So Anna, can I showed you a picture of her? Um, whenever I would write a paper, she was she was the, of the old ilk. She she wrote on your paper and she wrote in red ink. And so I would get these papers, you know, these manuscripts back, and it would be just like a litany of red marks. And I just finally said, would you use a blue pen? because it's so much easier to read. Um, but, you know, they really gave me good feedback. Always be energetic and, and enthusiastic. Nobody loves the Eeyore, so just think about it that way. Um, and you shouldn't be passive. You shouldn't feel entitled. You know, don't be disorganized. Don't be like 
do not expect your mentor to fix all your problems. All right, you, you have to be a part of this process, super important. So it is a feed forward, feedback on relationship. There are common binding threads. I, you know, I know we try to assign mentors, but I think some of the best mentor or mentee relationships are those that occur organically. Um, Bidirectional commitment, respect, flexibility, feedback, feedback, feedback. Be sure to tell your mentor what it is that you need so that they understand you know, what your gaps are. Um, there's you know, time management um, is critical for your success. I'm sure you've heard a lot about it, but the one thing that I'm gonna say is learn when to say yes and learn when to say no. Because these are the things that can make a huge difference. I'm not gonna dwell on that, but I'm happy to talk about it. Um, probably one-on-one -on -one is better, but that is, I think, out of all the things that I've learned about time management, that is the most important one. Um, communication game, um, really important to communicate um, what your needs are. Stress management, I'm gonna go through this. Um, really important to learn how to delegate, um, to divide and conquer. You wanna have those things that um, regenerate your inner energy. Um, you know, some of the things that are helpful for me is exercise, um, certainly aromatherapy I love, but knowing what it is is going to help you manage stress. Um, life work balance. I should just put an X through that because there is no such thing as life work balance. The way that I think about it, it's really, it's like having different balls in the air and the size of those balls change depending on where you are in your life. When I had little kids, the ball around family was big. As my kids got older, that ball was out and they were able to do things for themselves. That ball shrank while other things increased. So I don't really think personally there's a such thing as um, a life work, work on balance. And, you know, and this never happens in life either, right? Um, I, you know, I still think about one day when I came home and my son was just as happy as a, you know, a pea in a pod and my husband is watching basketball. And then I look and my son took up Sharpie and he drew all over a door. And my husband was oblivious um, that this was going on. And he, he, wrote with, <laughs> he wrote with the Sharpie, like a smile on his face. So I was just like, oh my God. So yeah, this never happens. Um, so I think it's an urban legend. Um, you know, there's no perfect time to marry. There's no perfect time to start a family. Um, your spouse or partner will always understand and ask no. You know, even though I've, you know, how long have I been taking call for the last 25 years? And I still have my kids say, why do you have to take call? Um, you know, and, and, and even my husband did the same thing. Um, you know, children don't always understand, but they eventually do. Um, you know, my, my daughter, who's now 25, you know, when I would take her to work with me, she didn't really appreciate it. She just felt like, you know, I should be at, you know, she should be at the park with me. But now she talks about those experiences and how meaningful they were for her in terms of her deciding what she wanted to do. Uh, my daughter is 25 and um, she is now at the University of Michigan. And her, um, what she's doing is she's um, studying to be um, a dentist, but she's also doing a PhD. Um, so she's doing a DDS PhD. I did not know that even existed until she told me she wanted to do it. But she, she reflects on her experiences with me and, and having the opportunity to go to work with me um, as things that impacted her. Um, you know, you don't always feel like you made the right decision. Um, sometimes we perseverate um, and that is typical. Um, you know, sometimes we look across the street and we think other people's lives are so perfect. And I'm here to tell you that's, it's just a facade. We all have our challenges. So, um, you know, just because it works for someone else doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Um, you know, and, you know, you always think my family would be perfect if only. Uh, I don't know that there's a perfect family. Um, you know, we all have our skeletons in the closet. You just have to be okay with it <laughs> and realize that there's some things you can control and there are other things you can and just roll with it. And, and that's what I've learned how to do. Um, uh, when I was, um, when I was, a, um, when I was younger in my career and I had um, younger kids, um, you know, there was this huge stress that I felt some, a lot of it was self-imposed, but some of it was also external that, you know, I wouldn't be a good mother if I worked. You know, if I did all these kind of, you know, if I did research, if I did um, leadership um, things. And, and so I always worried about 
about that. And I still remember when my daughter um, was in first grade, I um, signed up to be a class mother. That's probably the worst thing I ever did. Um, <laughs> And I say that honestly, uh, because the, the other class mother, she, she said to me, I am so sorry you have to work, <laughs> right? And I'm like, I have a career, what are you talking about? And then, you know, she, and her like focus was whether or not the plate should be green or black for Halloween. I was like, the kids won't care. They don't, all they want is the candy, you know? And so I was like, yeah, this wasn't the right fit for me. And so recognizing, you know, the things that you can do and the things that you want to do. And at the end of the day, if you, you know, your kids know you love them, that is what they thrive on. And, and showing them, you know, in different ways, I think is the most important thing. So, you know, you have to find the perfect balance for you. Um, you know, what is success? Um, I, I say successful people shape their own future, right? I don't decide for you what success is. You decide for yourself and you create your own uh, metric for that. Um, you don't let other people, their culture or their circumstances determine your path, right? Because other people try to determine my path, um, but I did not allow that. Um, always being self-aware, like, you know, what are your strengths? What are your challenges? Because we all have them. No one is perfect. And, and being resilient because it's not, you know, there are going to be times when you're like, what is this? And just being able to rise above it and see a path, you know, being able to see the trees for the forest is really important. Um, and so I have this um, W. Clement Stone comment, aim for the moon. If you miss, you may hit a star. And that's truly how I live my life. Um, how many people know what this is? Yeah, GPS, right? Uh, all right, so before I move to the next slide, how many people would just get in their car and drive? Nobody, right? Most people use the GPS, right? But you know where you're going, right? You, you know where you're starting, you know where you want to go. And this is how I think about a career. You know where you're starting, you should have an idea of where you wanna go. And it's okay to have some, you know, some detours, but you need to think about where it is you'd like to be. So how many people have a one-year plan? Probably everybody, right? How many people have a five-year plan? Mm, the numbers are getting lower. How many people have a 10-year plan? Yeah. So this is what I'm encouraging you to do, to think about your career path, to think about tomorrow, to think about five years from now, to think about 10 years from now. Do I wanna be a division director? Do I wanna be a department chair? Do I wanna be a dean? What does it take for me to get there? What will it take for me to get there? Who should I talk to? You should interview people. I'm talking to a lot of my junior faculty and my um, residents and my learners. Interview your chair. Uh-oh, Ellen, you're gonna get me. And just ask her about her path. How did she get to where she is? What are some of the things she felt were critical in her path? You learn from people. You learn what to do, you learn what not to do. And these are all valuable life experiences. So I encourage you to create an individual development plan. I call it a flexible plan because it can change. You know, I, you may start off thinking, I want to be, you know, I want to be a division director. And then you realize, actually, I'd rather, I don't know, be the president, not me. <laughs> it's a really hard job. But being able to think, uh, you know, about where you want to go and being flexible, knowing that, um, you know, you don't have to absolutely go that way. All right, so I'm just gonna go through this. I call the individual development plan is like you know your global positioning strategy. Um, and instead of it being you know something that you're just thinking about in the, you know from a day to day, really thinking about it from a five to ten year goal. All right, the things that you want to think about: what, who, and why, and when. <clears throat> You want to identify your mentors, identify the expertise of yourself and your other and others around you, leadership opportunities, and don't forget to include your personal goals like marriage, family, vacation, um, those uh, you know those trips that you always wanted to go on. Um, in terms of the individual development plan, you want to make sure you organize your goals in the context of your resources and organization missions. As a chair, it is so easy for me to say yes 
when you ask me, can you do something that's aligned with the mission and goals of the department or the organization, right? Because I have money to do that. I don't have money to do things that may not be aligned with those missions. So if you ever want Ellen to say yes, I'll make sure it's something that she's listed as part of her strategic plan. So I just, I'm gonna end there. I have, I have much more I can share with you, but I have definitely enjoyed this conversation with you and, and wanna say thank you and, and just say, if there are any questions, please talk to me now, talk to me later, send me an email, but thank you. There's one person that says, thank you for an outstanding lecture. I, know I, I give a similar talk to um, uh, a bunch of um, like fellows and, um, and junior faculty for the Endocrine Society. But I also have this exercise where we talk about the IDP and then they have to actually go and write one at night and come back the next day and then say it out loud to everybody. And I have them do that because that's a form of accountability. Right. If you say it out loud and you share, you know what, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be held accountable. And the other thing that we do with this program is that we send them an email, a, a letter, like six months to a year later. And what have you done since we last met? Can I tell you, people are terrified when they do that, but they, uh, but it, they, you know, once we do it, they enjoy it. So I encourage you all to do the same. Ellen. Thank you so much. We actually got a twofer here. We got an update on menopause and all your amazing expertise there and um, the uh, the talk about career development. Um, and you said exactly what I need you to say because we're doing a strategic plan uh, uh, next month. And uh, and we do have an IDP for everybody that comes in the department. And and I think it's really important that everybody understands that that their ideas and what we collectively decide to do in our five-year strategic plan, that is what we're going to be able to really put the resources in. So thank you for that. Um, I have a quick menopause question, um, having gone through the whole experience. Um, I'm missing my candy neurons, you know. Um, <laughs> but my question is, around the postpartum period when people get hot flashes. Um, I've always uh, thought and learned that it's sort of related to the ups and downs of estrogen. Um, but is there any, uh, any, any uh, candy component there? Uh, actually, um, it is. It actually, people who experience um, symptoms more so in a postpartum period, we think are probably likely to be our people who have severe symptoms in the menopause. And the thought is that they are really- I'm gonna say N of one, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and so the, the, the same mechanism we think is involved because we can trigger hot flashes in, in young people with the agonist for the, um, the tachykinin receptor. So it's the same process. Um, you know, understanding, um, you know, why some groups, um, like why there are racial and ethnic differences, some of it is genetic. But some of it is probably um, um, allostatic um, load as well. Um, so I, there is just so much more to do in, in the space of menopause. You know, when, when I think about it, for so many years, we made very little progress. Um, so the last 10, you know, 15 years really has been a game changer. And it's also helping us tease out, like, what's due the hot flashes? What's due to um, kind of aging? Right, because there's the combination of the two in terms of symptoms. And, and I think as we understand more, it'll help us really um, also direct treatment. But yes, it's candy neurons that are involved. Thank you very much for your lecture. Um, so, you know, I am absolutely fascinated by sort of the use of non-estrogen treatments and in, in, in treatment of essentially the menopausal transition and symptoms that go uh, with that. I think the um, fascinating part is, at least to me, is sleep disruption. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, there, there's, there's a significant amount of data out there, including I think in the Wisconsin sleep cohort that, um, 
folks in the menopausal transition and in menopause in general um, tend to have both obviously increased sleep fragmentation, which makes sense, but then also increased um, uh, sleep disorder breathing, like sleep apnea and, and sort of related disorders. And all of those obviously, you know, sort of import the cardiovascular function and related issues. So um, do you think that the agents that you're working with would impact any of that? And because I, I, I saw that there was improvement in sleep symptoms and was that, did, did, did you do any PSGs or like home studies and yeah, is anybody like pursuing that? Yeah, we're actually talking about that right now um, because we think that there's a component that's probably related to hot flashes, but there also is a component that may not be. And I think until we can tease out what's related to hot flashes, we're not going to understand kind of what, you know, what are some of the other drivers. Um, we do know that um, candy neurons project to areas that are involved in sleep. And so, you know, it is, I, again, I, I mean, this is when I become the ner super nerd, right? Because this is like so exciting. And it's, you know, the idea that you have these neurons that are, you know, modifying really important areas of regulation um, is super exciting. And, and it, you know, really offers an opportunity for us to, you know, when I think about from bench to bedside, you know, this, this is it. Like this has been my career trajectory, moving from the bench to the bedside and being able to really impact outcomes of health. You know, that's why I stayed in academic medicine. So yeah, I'm excited about it if you haven't figured that out. Thanks. I have a quick question back here. So, so I got a text message the other day. I was like, what do you think about testosterone? And I was like, for what? So I was curious if you have any thoughts about any up and coming changes in testosterone use for menopause. <laughs> So, you know, um, menopause is associated with reductions in testosterone. Part of it is ovarian related, but the other part is that SHBG um, is reduced because estrogen is reduced. And so you don't have as much free or total testosterone. Um, there are some people where, you know, they have, a re they have alterations in their interest in sex and, and there are some studies that suggest that it's, um, that it may be of benefit. Um, testosterone also is aromatized to estrogen. And so, you know, it can actually um, help, um, but it's not usually my first line of treatment unless people have some sexual dysfunction um, associated with it. Now, in women who've had um, oophorectomies, um, they're, they're, you know, to provide some testosterone, there's some benefit because they have, you know, they have complete loss out of it from the ovary, which still continues to make some DHEA. I just want to say, I, you know, I had, um, and I did this intentionally, I had the figure of the drug on the, um, on my, fig on my slides. And I just went for our learners. I was like, you know what? We are so far from organic chemistry, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, that's like a trigger, right? For PTSD, those, those um, drug shapes. There's only one more comment in the, in the chat right now, just from uh, Dr. Higgins saying that she especially loved hearing about your own career trajectory and your thoughts about IDPs. Thank you. We have three minutes. Who else has questions? <laughs> yes, I wanted to thank you again for the, uh, well, for all, the entire talk, but particularly the second part of the talk, really talking about your story and then also how others can learn in their own faculty development. Um, and I'm curious how you see the interaction of um, the mentor committee, we call it the promotion oversight committee, and the IDP, you know, the IDP being something that changes kind of slowly over time in the mentor committee meeting regularly, and just insights into that and how to best utilize those two things. Yeah, so one thing I didn't say that I want to make sure I say, you know, the IDP is not used as a way to determine whether or not you get an incentive, or, you know, it's, it's really a way to help you gauge where you are personally. Um, and, and where you need to go. So that's really important because I've had people not want to do it because they think it's going to be used as a way to determine, you know, um, promotion and, and stuff like that. It's, that's not the purpose of an IDP. Um, in terms of how it interacts with um, the mentors, it actually is very helpful for a mentor to see kind of what it is you think that you need to do and what you need to do that because it helps us think about how we need to help you. Um, so it really is, um, you know, an iterative process 
And it's really important for people to think about it. It's just that, right? So you've achieved these, you know, your goal was to write, you know, a paper, right? And you achieve that. So, you know, what, what is your next goal and how is that going to help you with promotion? Because your goal may be to get promoted, right? And so what is it that you need to be promoted? What's missing in your, you know, in, in terms of the things that you've done? So it's really a, I think of it as like a map, right? I really do. I think of it as like your GPS as a way to start here and to get there. And, you know, in the places that you're going change over time. And so using it just that way. Thank you. So I, I have a question. So, uh, so going back to the menopausal studies, uh, you mentioned that there is dysregulation in metabolism. And we know that heat generation is related to metabolism and there is a whole pathway of how heat is generated. So is that dysregulation that you talk about, is that systemic? Or is it specifically in the neurons, the candy neurons, or yeah, in the so it's it's, spe it's specifically in the candy neurons where there's this dysregulation, and then their their dysfunction yeah. is then affecting other areas, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So it's not that the other areas, because if you can regulate the activity of the generation of the um, candy neurons, you can fix some of the other areas that are being affected by those gotcha. neurons. Okay, it's interesting. Thanks. So they're the disruptors. Yeah. Thanks. Any more questions? Well, thank you so much. I really um, enjoy the opportunity um, to be here and to intake the lovely city of um, Madison and, and the wonderful other UW experience. So thank you. Let's start our next session. <laughs> Yeah. All right, we are going to start our next session. Uh, please take your seats. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Brad Bossy. And to introduce him, uh, Dr. Janine Rhodes will be introducing him. So, Janine. Oh, and I forgot to mention that there are these this QR codes at the end of the, each row. So if you scan this, you'll get uh, access to the whole program for today. All right, good morning. I'm Janine Rhodes, the program director for our MFM fellowship. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Brad Bossy, our graduating third year MFM fellow. Uh, Dr. Bossy is from Reno, Nevada. He did his undergraduate in medical school at the University of Nevada. Um, he completed a residency at University of California, Irvine. And his mentors there highly recommended him to us. So we were super fortunate to bring him here to Madison for his fellowship. He has been a fantastic fellow with us. And today we'll present his fellowship thesis project, um, which has focused on PFAS exposure in the water and uh, preeclampsia in our obstetric population. All right, thank you guys and good morning. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present um, our research today. It's exciting. Um, so the title of the talk is Preeclampsia. It's in the water, um, an analysis of PFAS concentrations in the serum of preeclamptic patients in Madison, Wisconsin. There it goes. Um, so I have no disclosures for this talk. Ooh, I went back. Here we go. So in terms of background, preeclampsia is common, affecting 2 to 8% of pregnancies internationally each year and is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. Despite substantial advances, the underlying mechanism remains incompletely understood. One working theory is that there's numerous pathogenic insults that may activate three common pathways, including endothelial cell activation, intravascular inflammation, and syncytiotrophoblast stress, resulting in the development of preeclampsia. As such, further identification of such pathogenic insults remains important to better understand 
those that may be at risk for developing preeclampsia and work um, to develop strategies for prevention. PFAS or PER and polyfluorinated alkaline substances are one major potential pathogenic insult that has been suggested as having an association with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and preeclampsia. These molecules are extremely stable and resistant to degradation due to their chemical structure. Um, this gives them widespread industrial and commercial uses, but has also caused issues with environmental contamination and toxic accumulation in humans. At the state, local, and national levels, there have been concerns regarding PFAS contamination in drinking water and in surface waters. The current data demonstrates, uh, excuse me, the current data remain mixed, however, regarding the association of PFAS exposure and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. These differences may be due to differences in study design, differences in study population, and exposures to different PFAS types, concentrations, and mixtures, which are known to vary between different studies and across regions. The objective, the objective of our study was to evaluate for the presence of PFAS in blood of pregnant patients with preeclampsia compared to that of controls in our local population in Madison, Wisconsin. Our hypothesis is that if there is an association between PFAS and preeclampsia, then the number and quantity of PFAS molecules would be greater in the patients with preeclampsia. In terms of study design, this was a prospective pilot case controlled study consisting of 40 participants, 20 preeclamptic cases and 20 controls. Patients were recruited from May 2021 to January 2023 at a single institution in Madison, Wisconsin. Informed consent was obtained from all study participants and this study had IRB approval from Unity Point Health Meritor as well as the University of Wisconsin. Inclusion criteria for the study um, required individuals to have the diagnosis of preeclampsia, which was defined as new hypertension greater than 20 weeks gestation with blood pressures greater than 140 over 90, two times more than four hours apart. Participants also had to have newly documented proteinuria as defined as a urine protein to creatinine ratio greater than 0 0.3 or a 24 hour urine protein collection greater than 300 milligrams. Preeclampsia with severe features was also included within this group. Participants also had to be greater than 18 years of age, have a single ten gestation, be greater than 34 weeks gestation, and able to consent in English. Exclusion criteria included a history of chronic hypertension as previously reported within the EMR or documented with blood pressures greater than 140 over 90 before 20 weeks gestation. Individuals were also excluded if they had eclampsia, coagulopathy, multifetal gestations, active withdrawal from illicit, substance to, illicit substances, um, or clinical situations requiring delivery prior to enrollment. Gestational age match controls were also enrolled. Um, they were individuals without the diagnosis of preeclampsia who otherwise satisfied the previous specified inclusion and exclusion criteria. For each study participant, once enrolled, whole blood samples were collected into EDTA tubes. Within one hour of collection, specimens were centrifuged and the plasma aliquoted. The plasma specimen was then stored at negative um, 80 degrees Celsius. These samples were then later sent to the Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene, where liquid chromatography tandem mass spectro spectrometry um, was performed to measure the plasma concentrations of 38 legacy and replacement PFAS compounds. Uh, maternal and newborn data was obtained from the electronic medical record, and the information was stored in REDCap. Statistical analysis was carried out using STATA and student T test and chi-square analysis was performed for continuous and categorical variables, respectively. Odds ratios were calculated and logistic regression um, was performed to adjust for confounding variables. Now for our results. Both maternal age and pre-pregnancy BMI were found to be statistically different between the groups. While gestational age at enrollment was similar between the groups, gestational age at delivery was statistically different. Race was similar between the groups with the majority of individuals being white. Parity was similar between the groups as well. Only one individual had a history of preeclampsia within each group, and there were no documented smokers within the study. There were a total of 10 individuals within the preeclamptic arm that did have severe features. Regarding the newborn data, as mentioned before, there was a statistical difference in gestational age at time of delivery between the groups. 
This likely accounts for the differences noted in NICU admission and duration of hospitalization between cases in preeclamptic controls. Um, fetal sex, fetal weight, the incidence of small for gestational age infant as defined by less than um, the 10th percentile calculated by Fenton newborn curves and APGAR scores were similar between the groups. Um, when looking at the sample data, all samples contain PFAS. 16 of the 38 PFAS tested um, were detected. Um, PFOS was the predominant PFAS within both groups, and PFOS had twofold higher concentrations in preeclampsia versus controls. Here in the left, we see the, the um, concentration of PFOS in the preeclamptic arm versus controls being twofold greater. A sensitivity analysis was then performed comp um, comparing PFAS concentrations with preeclampsia with severe features versus controls. This analysis found a statistically significant association between PFOS concentrations and preeclampsia with severe features, um, but this was not true of the other uh, PFAS detected. Here's a graph showing that as well. For PFOS concentrations, quartiles were calculated to identify those concentrations greater than the 75th percentile for all study participants. Odds ratios were calculated to measure the association between plasma PFOS concentration greater than the 75th percentile and the development of preeclampsia or preeclampsia with severe features. Adjusted odds ratios were calculated controlling for obesity or BMI greater than 30. While these numbers do demonstrate a positive association, caution should be taken when interpreting this data. The large confidence intervals reported here highlight the low level of precision associated with each odds ratio, which is likely due to the rather small sample size in this preliminary data. So in conclusion, all samples contain PFAS, PFOS, PFOA, PFHXS, and PFNA were found in all samples with PFOS being the highest um, predominating PFAS. Um, it was twofold higher in the preeclamptic arm versus controls, and the mean concentration was even higher in um, preeclampsia with severe features. But increased sample size is necessary before conclusions can be drawn regarding this association. Um, strengths of the study include that it was prospective. There were strict inclusion criteria for the diagnosis of preeclampsia, and to my knowledge, this is the first um, assessment of PFAS in a pregnant population locally. Um, limitations include the study's small sample size, its unbinded nature. This was also a racially homo homogenous uh, population, and there was a disproportionately large number of patients with severe features in, pre in the preeclamptic arm. It should also be noted that as a case-controlled control study, um, this is only capable of demonstrating associations and further work is needed to establish causal relationships between PFAS and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. That brings us to a shout out for Dr. Kumar's lab, who've been great in collaborating on this project. They conducted this study looking at PFOS exposure in pregnant rats, finding increased angiotensin II activity and decreased endothelial dependent vasodilation in uterine arteries and exposed dams. This was published in 2022, and they continue to work to try to unwrap these causative mechanisms. Future directions include expanding the sample size in these human subjects, potentially geomapping to highlight at risk populations, engaging in patient education and public outreach and um, ongoing laboratory work to better understand uh, the causative mechanism underlying PFOS-induced hypertension in pregnancy. Um, funding was through the fellowship research program. Huge thank you to Dr. Hoppe and Dr. Rhodes for their mentorship, mentorship throughout this project, um, as well as Dr. Kumar's lab, Jay Shri and Roland for their help and collaboration. Um, huge shout out to the residents for helping approach a lot of these patients to get them enrolled, um, and the patients themselves for being willing to be involved in this study. Some references. Open it up to any questions. So we have time for questions. Thank you for um, such an interesting um, presentation. There, I guess there were a couple of things that stood out to me. Were you surprised or do you think it was a power issue that there was not a difference in fetal size? I mean, that's been found in the rat models for sure, that the, the um, offspring of dams that are exposed do have smaller size overall. So I think it's, it's likely just our sample size is relatively small. And um, do, do you have a sense of... Do you have a sense of in terms of exposure, because you talk about geo coding mm -hmm. and, and thinking about that. So do you have a sense of for your population of patients where there are specific groups of people who are more likely to be exposed? 
it's it's something that we've definitely thought about. We do know that there's a lot of um, you know well data that's available throughout Dane County and in the Madison area, and there are certain wells that have highlighted increased um, amounts of PFAS in the drinking water. Um, we also know that the surface water, which at one of the initial slides was showing kind of the chain of lakes that are around uh, Madison, um, and the surface water does have exceedingly high levels of PFOS. So people who are consuming things like fish would be at high risk for exposure. This is also an endocrine disruptor, right? right. And so are you seeing in that same population um, other endocrine disorders? Um, we didn't, but again, really small, small sample size. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I'm trying to have a question. So, you know, there is, because these are endocrine disruptors, mm -hmm. uh, there is also a lot of data on uh, how the, in the lakes, uh, how these chemicals affect uh, the fish population. Mm -hmm. And there are some reproductive tract disorders that you see in fish or frogs and those type of things. Mm -hmm. Have those been also reported in our area? In a human population? Oh, right? No, yeah. even in, in, in wildlife population. Yeah, you know, you know, I'm not sure. Okay. That's really interesting though. Because there are some, like some of these molecules can affect uh, like in amphibians. Right. They yeah. affect the reproductive uh, tract yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah. I wonder if there is a correlation. Yeah, definitely could be. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Bossi, just to talk about geospacing uh, or geocoding or whatever a little bit, we, I just, I think it's important to know when you have a small sample size, our discussion about the ability to do that. So if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, um, it's it's a, a pretty challenging um, topic. We do have like a strategy to potentially get around it though, but um, geomapping this small number of patients would be difficult to find, you know, those associations likely. Um, but interestingly, I mean, you think about like proximity from an individual's home to a certain well, um, that's probably not what we're most interested in, but rather which wells are servicing certain addresses. Um, it would be challenging though too, because that's just one potential source for exposure. Um, and there's you know many, as we know that it's so universally uh, used all these PFAS models. Well, and we actually had a conversation about doing this. And so, that, so it also can be, um, when you have a small sample size, it can be uh, like HPI concerning, you know, like you're pointing out points on a map. And so it might lead you to like, identify people easier than if you have a large sample size. And so yeah. we were sort of yeah. asked not to do it rather than to do it. So I just think that's interesting to think about. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea. And in terms of samples, I mean, we have, we've doubled the sample size. We just don't have the results back yet. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much. This was a great presentation and really made me think about what's in my water. <laughs> um, uh, are there, do you know whether, I know the survey of the health of Wisconsin banks a lot of samples and I'm wondering whether you could explore sort of geographic correlates within those. I know Show is really interested in sort of using their banked samples for research questions. They don't have a lot of pregnant people, but I wonder if you could answer some questions that would help integrate with your data well using Show. I don't know if you've explored that at all. Yeah. But that's a great idea. If you send me an email, I'll connect you with them. That was a great presentation. Um, for the, uh, Dr. Pantakar's comments, the Department of Natural Resources in Wisconsin is looking at PFAS and, and collecting studies on that in uh, wildlife. Um, one of the interesting things is that they were looking at where it uh, stays in water levels. And for things like mercury, there's like a known level mm -hmm. that it'll collect at. But with PFAS, there's not shown to be a level, which is kind of crazy. Um, but uh, for PFAS in your study, I didn't. I saw that there's a higher proportion of severe preeclamptics that you saw in your patient population. Um, I didn't see anything for things like early onset versus late onset preeclampsia, and I was wondering if you think with higher po patient population samples, um, if you'd see any difference that PFAS had in um, early onset versus late, since they're they're kind of two different uh, disease processes. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. I think um, I think there have been studies looking at early onset versus late. This study obviously highlighted later gestational age individuals. Those were all that were included after 34 weeks gestation. Um, but certainly, you know, higher concentrations, more severe forms of disease. This population, while it's maybe not as generalizable because of the 50% of individuals that did have severe features of preeclampsia, does give a unique opportunity to sort of highlight that highest risk group with these highest concentrations of the of the chemicals. And I don't think that's been described before at all um, because they want such high you know, um, population numbers. So those are tough cases to find. Okay, there's one question. Do you know if certain counties based on political affiliation experience more water contamination? Um, I don't know that in particular. Um, a lot of what I focused on from the environmental side um, mm -hmm. was more focused in Dane County in particular. Right. Um, but this is a problem that affects many, like every county in, in the state of Wisconsin. Okay. I think we are out of time. Okay. Thank you. Brad. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So to introduce our new next speaker, Dr. Rose will introduce the next speaker. I always know to get out of Autumn's way. <laughs> it's been keeping me on task for a while now. Um, pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Zhang. Uh, she's our uh, senior fellow in gynecologic oncology. Uh, Dr. Zhang, <clears throat> excuse me, attended the University of Wisconsin for undergrad and med school. In fact, she had a full ride uh, for all four years at the University of uh, Iowa. I said Wisconsin, University of Iowa. Uh, she also earned her master's in public health at the University of Iowa and graduated magna cum laude there. Uh, she went on to complete her uh, residency at the University of Minnesota, and we were happy to recruit her here for fellowship. Uh, she's also going to be joining our faculty in September. Um, we had a great group of applicants this year for faculty, and we were really, really happy <clears throat> that Catherine decided to stay with us. Her research interests include cervical cancer prevention, identification of novel biomarkers for early detection of recurrence, venous thromboembolism prevention, and development of innovative surgical techniques. Dr. Zhang. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so today I will be discussing the liquid biopsy circulating um, tumor DNA um, and its promising role in cervical cancer. Globally, cervical cancer is the fourth leading cause of cancer death in women. Um, in the United States, cervical cancer disproportionately affects uh, women of color. So Hispanic women have the highest rates of developing cervical cancer, and Black women have the highest rates of dying from cervical cancer. Although there is effective screening tests for the early detection of dysplasia and cervical cancer, and with PAP and HV testing, um, there's really a need for better surveillance strategies for the early detection of recurrence um, that can increase cure as well as response rates to salvage therapy. Um, history and physical examination are really the only consistent methods that have been reported to be effective for the detection of recurrence. Um, they often only detect recurrence once it's visible or causing symptoms. And really there's a paucity of data um, that routine cytology or imaging improved detection um, of cervical cancer recurrence. Um, as we know, essentially all cases of cervical cancer are attributed to HPV with 16 and 18 accounting for 70% of cases in the US. Cervical cancer is unique um, from other cancer types because HPV infection is a crucial step in tumoral genesis and HPV DNA material is nearly universal in tumor cells. And so a liquid biopsy a test to detect circulating tumor HPV DNA in the serum really could have significant clinical utility. I wanted to review a little bit about cell-free DNA and the history. Um, so cell-free DNA was actually originally discovered back in the 1940s um, in the blood of healthy individuals, um, but really was not used to detect tumor-specific mutations until the mid-1990s. NIPT um, or non-invasive prenatal testing really drove much of the development of circulating tumor DNA uh, technology. 
And as NIPT was more widely adopted, um, it was noted that some women with genetic abnormalities in their plasma, um, that didn't correlate to fetal abnormalities. Um, and some of these actually were determined to originate from uh, undiagnosed maternal cancer. So in this diagram, as you can see, um, when released from tumor cells undergoing necrosis or apoptosis, the cell-free DNA we often refer to as circulating tumor DNA or ctDNA. Um, there is ongoing research looking at the use of ctDNA for cancer screening, um, identification of novel biomarkers, evaluation of treatment response, um, determining mechanisms of drug resistance, and as well as uh, det uh, determining um, early detection of recurrence. The difficulty um, in ctDNA is really its detection. The majority of plasma cell-free DNA um, is derived from normal cells, and there is actually a very low abundance of ctDNA or DNA containing tumor cells. Um, this is typically around 1% of all cell-free DNA, but can be as low as 0.01% in early stage cancers. And so in liquid biopsies, this extremely low concentration of ctDNA in the blood poses a significant te technological challenge. So working with um, Dr. Lisa Berlet and Manish Patankar's group, I performed a feasibility study investigating the use of circulating tumor um, HPV DNA as a biomarker for detection of cervical cancer. Um, our hypo hypothesis uh, was kind of twofold. One was circulating tumor HPV DNA is a clinically useful biomarker for the detection of recurrent cervical cancer, and two, it may facilitate early detection of recurrence than routine exams, imaging studies, and PAP testing. Um, our research aims... Um, the first one was to first develop a PCR assay, so a selection of appropriate PCR primers um, that would be able to detect high-risk HPV 16 and 18. And then our second aim was the use of this validated PCR assay to determine the clinical utility of circulating tumor HPV DNA um, in the setting of uh, cervical cancer recurrence. Notably, um, prior studies have also looked into this um, and use of conventional PCR techniques have shown a low detection of serum circulating tumor HPV DNA of only about 12 up to at most 45%. However, digital PCR um, offers much higher sensitivity. So I wanted to just briefly go over how droplet digital PCR works. Um, so the sample is initially partitioned to about 20,000 droplets, and this is using water emulsion technology um, as well as use, use of microfluidics, um, so it's uh, partitioned into the, uh, within these um, microchannels. The PCR um, is actually carried out within each of these droplets using a thermocycler, and then the sample is run through a reader. Um, where droplets containing target DNA sequences display a higher fluorescence intensity and are read as positive droplets. Um, and those below a certain threshold of fluorescence are read as negative droplets um, and not containing the targeted sequence. Um, so this kind of displays the separation of these droplets um, and then the fluorescence, um, as I was mentioning. Um, so then each droplet is plotted on this 1D um, plot graph of fluorescence intensity, which is um, demonstrated in the y-axis, um, and droplet number on the x-axis right here. All the positive droplets um, are below the red threshold line, which is here. So these are all positive droplets um, and are scored as positive and given a value of 1. And all the negative droplets below this red threshold line are um, given a uh, negative or assigned a value of zero. Then starting concentration of the target DNA is estimated through a poison distribution modeling. Um, I'm not going to pretend that I fully understand um, that uh, statistical analysis. Um, so... Going back, um, so again, my first aim was to develop the CTHPV uh, droplet digital PCR assay. Um, so we designed uh, primers that specifically detected the amplicon um, uh, within the E7 gene encoded by high-risk HPV 16 and 18. 
Um, so as you may remember, uh, E6 and E7 are the primary oncoproteins, um, with E6 targeting the P53 induced apoptosis pathway, and E7 um, uh, targeting the rat retinoblastoma, inhibiting it and thus allowing cell cycle evasion. Um, so then oncogenes E6 and E7 um, are usually the most often targeted because of their highly amplified sequences in tumor genomes. And E7 is actually preferred because of its high conservation. Um, and that's why we selected primers uh, targeting E7. Um, we then validated um, this assay with PBS and control plasma that was spiked um, with um, increasing concentrations of 16 and 18 segments. Um, and then a droplet digital PCR assay was run uh, for quantification. Um, optimal annealing temperature and primer concentration were, were determined using um, this um, assay and as well as um, concentration titrations. Um, and as you can see here, um, with our droplet digital PCR, we found a very high um, and good correlation between expected HPV copy number and what we actually found with our assay. Um, and the titration analysis graphed here um, showed an exceptional linearity with the R-square value of 0 0.98. Um, and this was over five uh, magnitudes, orders of magnitude. So next we tested this HPV assay within a patient who had cervical cancer, um, so widely uh, metastatic cervical cancer, we found that there, she had over 109,000 copies of HPV 18 E7 gene. Um, her plasma was negative for HPV 16, um, and this was confirmed with PAP uh, test um, HPV genotyping, which found the tumor to be HPV 18 positive and HPV 16 negative. Um, so, you know, next steps, um, our initial next step was really to determine the clinical utility of our assay, um, and particularly in cervical cancer recurrence. But most recently, after meeting as a group, we wondered why not study um, the utility of this CT HPV DNA in all HPV attributable, attributable cancers. Um, so this table uh, displays data that um, was reported by the CDC um, in the United States in 2021. It shows the incidence of HPV-driven cancers. Um, oral pharyngeal cancer is actually now the most common HPV-related cancer in the US, followed by cervical, anal, and then vulvovaginal. Um, most of the data looking at ctDNA um, in the prognostication early detection recurrence is actually an HPV-driven oral pharyngeal cancer. In other HPV-driven cancers, such as cervical and anal cancer, the data is really limited to retrospective studies um, and then a very small number um, of prospective studies. And in vulval vaginal cancer, there's really no studies to date looking at this. So we're in the process. Um, of rolling out a longitudinal observational study um, to validate and test the clinical utility of circulating tumor DNA in HPV-associated um, cancers, so including cervical, vulvar, HPV-related oral pharyngeal and anal cancer, um, and specifically looking at the detection of this um, in local advanced disease as well as metastatic disease. Um, looking at this in, in patients who are under surveillance, so identifying recurrence, um, and then also quantifying circulating tumor HPV DNA mid-treatment to better assess the treatment, um, the um, levels of circulating tumor DNA um, during treatment. And our plan um, is to really use a head and neck cancer as a um, kind of a control group since most of the data is in that currently. So I want to have lots of things to give. Um, thank you uh, to Dr. Barlett, um, who served as my research mentor, um, Manish Panekar and his lab members who helped me immensely, particularly Arvinder Kapoor. Um, Dustin Rubenstein helped me um, as far as uh, developing the primers for this assay. Um, and then Dan Stevens helped me to figure out how to use droplet digital PCR. Um, I received funding from the department um, for this research and then as well as for the Carbon Cancer Center um, uh, provided uh, funding for me to present this um, at the International Gynecologic Cancer Society um, meeting. These are my references. Any questions? <laughs> so we have time for questions.
Uh, great job, Catherine. Um, you mentioned the literature is more robust in the head and neck cancers. Are they actually uh, at the point where they're they're clinically using this um, the ctDNA? So currently they have an ongoing uh, perspective study. I believe it's a phase three trial um, that we're actually enrolling. We're one of the sites um, where they're looking at use of ctDNA um, to determine treatment response um, and whether or not uh, it, it would allow de-escalation um, for patients. Um, so they're not currently using it clinically, um, but they're definitely moving in that direction. What a fantastic project. Yeah, thanks. That's amazing. Um, you know, I guess when I was looking at just the uh, distribution of the types of HPV cancers, can you, with your assay, determine which one it might be or originating from? So um, if you were to do an assay in someone who has rectal mm -hmm. HPV-related cancer, it, it's not you're not able to really define where? Yeah, so the, this ass assay would not allow you to determine the origin um, since it's just based on serum. Um, uh, so that brings up an interesting question because especially in the surveillance setting, potentially you could be detecting a secondary primary cancer instead of a recurrence of your initial one. Um, so unfortunately, this assay wouldn't be able to tell you exactly where it came from um, unless, you know, it, it, it was um, a different HPV strain. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, I was also thinking about um, ovarian cancer and yep. um, breast cancer. So, do you mm -hmm. see this um, yeah. technique? Yep, um, yep. There, there's, um, there's quite a bit of robust data in use of ctDNA in breast cancer, um, and and there's a lot of um, hot you know, research going into ctDNA and ovarian cancer. And um, Dr. Hardenbach is actually looking into some of that. So, <laughs> great, thank you. Great job, Catherine. And thank you for getting me to think about something besides ovarian cancer in our lab. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I'm wondering, I always think of cervical cancer as such a global burden, and mm -hmm. I wonder how you think this technology could potentially be used in limited resource settings. Yeah. Um, you know, initially when I was looking into research for this, um, I was hoping that we could use this as a way to initially detect cervical cancer. Um, I think that would allow much wider global utility. Of course, um, you have to kind of talk about the costs, um, especially since cervical cancer predominantly affects um, countries, lower socioeconomic status. Um, but unfortunately, you know, as I alluded to in my presentation, um, the amount of ctDNA um, within the serum is so low that it's hard to detect, especially early stages at this time. Um, but maybe, you know, hopefully there is a path in which there's better technology that's developed that we can eventually use it as um, actually a way to detect it initially. Great presentation, Catherine. I have a question that we were discussing uh, back here. Would you expect the ctDNA to be elevated or present in patients with dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia? So not really. Okay. Um, it, it, it's hard to detect in patients who have dysplasia. Um, I think, again, because the numbers are so low. Um, I think even in like early cancer, sometimes you only detect five to 10 copies in one milliliter sample. Um, so they've looked at this in dysplasia um, and most of the time you can't detect it. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. All right, so we move on to our next speaker, um, and I will introduce uh, Dr. Soma Banerjee. So Soma is a graduate student, a PhD student in Dr. Alex Tanik's lab. Um, Soma received her, she's an MD uh, OBGYN by training in, from India. And then after she arrived here in the US, um, she, I had the privilege of having her in my lab doing a master's. 
and she was so tra traumatized by that experience that she took a five year five year break <laughs> uh, to recover from that. And then now she's back in Dr. Stanick's lab and working on PCOS. So Soma, are you? Thank you, uh, Manish, for the wonderful introduction. Um, and thanks to the department for giving me this opportunity to present my research. Uh, my talk today is titled High Dimensional Flow Cytometry Analysis of Immune Subsets in the Circulation and Follicular Microenvironment in Polycystic Ovary Syndrome, or PCOS. So the Rotterdam Diagnostic Criteria for PCOS uh, is the presence of two out of any three of the following, uh, clinical hirsutism or biochemical hyperandrogenism, intermittent menstrual cycles, and polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. There are accompanying metabolic dysfunctions like uh, insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, obesity, and hyperlipidemia, all of which constitute the metabolic syndrome. A little bit of the background. Uh, why are we studying it? Because PCOS is the most common cause of anovulatory infertility presenting in our clinics. Uh, it's associated with low-grade inflammation and uh, serum inflammatory markers. It's associated with metabolic, cardiovascular, and psychological health effects, so which have long-term long consequences. Uh, we are leveraging patient population undergoing IVF in a specialty clinic that gives us the unique opportunity to investigate both the normal ovarian cellular components as well as the effects of PCOS pathology in the ovary. And individual cellular assessment can suggest valuable targets for larger studies and other mechanistic investigations for the pathology. Uh, the major challenges, of course, are because of ethical and legal concerns, tissue access, unless clinically indicated, is a difficulty. And here we have the opportunity, because of clinical indications, that we are uh, able to directly access ovarian follicles and the follicular fluid for uh, cellular assessment. The advantages are... <clears throat> We are accessing the follicles in a normally indicated clinical care scenario. The patients are undergoing IVF treatment. So this is a group and population of patients who are highly studied and well characterized. We can sample blood, follicular fluid, and clinical data at the same time. And we are monitoring these patients over a concentrated time period. So we have the opportunity to not just uh, get all this clinical data while treatment, but uh, post-treatment, uh, post-ovulation induction, we can also uh, get records for uh, the <clears throat> efficacy of our treatment and uh, um, pregnancy rates and uh, data regarding all of those. <clears throat> uh, the disadvantages are um, IVF treatment affects the physiology of the disease itself. We are normalizing some of the uh, pathological conditions which lead to anovulation. So controlled ovarian stimulation can fix some of the hormonal and possible immune pathologies in the ovarian microenvironment. So despite what we know of the clinical manifestations of P PCOS, some of the outstanding questions are, what is the inflammatory signature uh, difference in the systemic circulation versus the ovarian microenvironment? Which immune cells direct inflammation, especially in the ovarian follicles? So a detailed map of follicular immune composition at a high subset resolution is still lacking. And the primary objective of this study was to create a cellular map of the normal and PCOS affected follicular immune composition. Uh, the inclusion and exclusion criteria are uh, the PCOS or test group satisfy the Rot uh, Rotterdam diagnostic criteria. Our control group has regular menstrual cycles. They have male or tubal factor infertility or a pre-implantation genetic diagnosis of inherited condition. All of our patients have normal ovarian reserve and are planning to undergo IVF. 
The exclusion criteria are pregnancy, uh, age less than 18 or over 44, and uh, pathological conditions which we know have an immune pathology or have a low success rate in IVF, like uh, endometriosis, diabetes, other immune pathologies like autoimmune conditions, active malignancy, uh, pelvic inflammation, and recurrent pregnancy loss. Uh, <clears throat> so this is our protocol for uh, tissue collection. After recruitment, uh, after recruitment for IVF, we we collect uh, pre-treatment uh, first blood sample, which is the peripheral or baseline blood sample, and it is usually a patient in the early follicular phase. We collect the peripheral blood immune cells. At visit to or after ovulation in a controlled ovarian uh, stimulation at the IVF uh, transvaginal ovum retrieval appointment, we collect a peripheral blood sample and we collect follicular fluid from two to three uh, dominant follicles uh, and isolate the uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells or the PBMC and the follicular cells uh, from these specimens, which are then cryopreserved. The study design and analysis protocol. So <clears throat> the cells are, th are thawed and then they are um, labeled with their uh, surface and intracellular antibodies for transcription factors. We label for uh, FMO controls and single color controls. Uh, we have three flow cytometry panels looking at uh, innate lymphoid cells or ILCs, antigen presenting cells or APCs, a T cell panel and a surface antigen panel. We then uh, perform a five laser uh, spectral flow cytometry with the Cytec Aurora. The data is analyzed and visualized by conventional uh, gating with uh, Flojo. Uh, we've done graph pan analysis to do the statistical analysis. We have also done clustering studies on them, TSME, followed by FlowSum clustering. Uh, and uh, annotation of the clusters using the same markers that we have used in our flow antibody panels. So the questions that we are asking is, are the immune, uh, is the immune cell landscape in the ovarian follicles distinct from the systemic circulation? Uh, <clears throat> these are results from our uh, conventional flow, uh, flow geo gating of the individual uh, cell populations. For time constraints, uh, I'm not showing the gating strategy. What we have found is uh, the follicular fluid is depleted in uh, plasma cytroid dendritic cells, classical monocytes, uh, and uh, activated uh, and memory T regulatory cells. These are uh, differences in the PBMC and the follicular fluid compartment. Uh, we have not uh, designated them or divided them into control versus PCOS. We are looking at all of our patients uh, and the differences between their follicular cells uh, and the uh, circulating PBMC. The next slide is uh, similarly uh, the difference between uh, T cells. So the follicular fluid shows an, an increase in TH17 and CD4 exhausted cells, but they are depleted in CD4 naive and uh, central memory uh, T cells. Uh, we also see some follicular fluid enrichment uh, trends of innate lymphoid cells, ILC1, ILC3, and LTI-like cells as well as intermediate monocytes and non-classical monocytes, but none of these reached uh, levels of significance. So for this entire study, we have a total number of 33 patients, 13 controls and 20 PCOS, and these are paired T-test comparisons between the PBMC and follicular fluid immune cells. So the, we come to the conclusion that the intrafollicular inflammatory compartment is distinct from circulation with a difference in distribution of key immune cell subsets between the two um, compartments. The second question obviously is, does PCOS alter the normative signature in follicular and systemic immunome? The only significant finding that we had was 
that the follicular fluid in PCOS shows a higher number of classical monocytes. And there is a trend for CTLA-4 T regulatory cells to be higher, but again, it has not reached levels of significance difference. The next, we visualize the immunocellular data by TSNI and clustering by the FlowSum um, <clears throat> plugin from Flojo. And uh, we did the annotation of the different clusters. Uh, this is just a representative. Uh, so I've just shown the data from one small experiment. And this is the surface antigen panel. I apologize, the slides look really cute. I don't know what went wrong. Um, but what we see is that PVMC versus uh, follicular cells um, show different unique populations. The PBMC shows uh, plasma cytoid cells as well as CD103 positive T, uh, T8 cells. And the follicular compartment has uh, non-classical monocytes. So there are differences in the peripheral circulation and the follicular fluid immune compartment. Uh, we are analyzing uh, our data further and we intend to uh, do more uh, <clears throat> more analysis to determine the other panels as well. Uh, these the conclusions that we can come are there are site specific differences between circulation and follicular fluid. PCOS appears to alter the immune cell composition in follicular fluid and high dimensional flow cytometry with dimensionality reduction and machine learning is a powerful tool for identification of different immune cell populations and can reveal important uh, differences and targets in pathologies such as PCOS. Uh, future directions. Uh, we intend to use machine learning algorithms to determine unique cell populations, which are differentially regulated in normal and PCOS conditions. Uh, we also uh, would like to <clears throat> do single cell RNA sequencing with limited surface protein analysis or site sequencing to determine the alteration in cell signaling pathways and transcriptomic programming of the uh, immune cells, as well as non-immune follicular cells like the granulosa theca cell complex. Uh, with that, I would like to thank my PIs, my committee, my lab members, the ERP program, um, the collection and uh, and recruiting team, consenting team from the Generations Fertility Care, our patients and UW Flow Core, and my funding. Thank you. So we have time for questions. Uh, Uh, thank you for an interesting, um, that interesting presentation. I guess a couple things um, uh, popped out to me when you're kind of talking about your model and um, specifically obesity um, and vitamin D deficiency, which are both more, can be more prevalent in women or individuals with PCOS. And I'm just curious how you're um, adjusting for that risk in terms of inflammation in your model. So we have, uh, um... Uh, paired patients which matching BMI and so we have BMI matched controls uh, as and I'm actually analyzing uh, the different clinical data uh, as well as the like I've done cytokine analysis as well vitamin D is something we have not looked at but BMI definitely and we see there are trends which show that there are differences in the number of oocytes we've retrieved uh, the uh, positive uh, the, the beta HCG positive tests uh, and also term deliveries. So we are looking at the data and we see a positive correlation with BMI as well as uh, with some cytokine panels and angiogenic factors. The cellular data is something I'm looking at right now, but we're expecting that we'll see differences there as well. Vitamin D is not something we've looked yeah, at. Yeah, because I would think those are independent modifiers of risk in terms of infl inflammatory markers. And, and I think that's really important in your model. Um, the, the other thing um, yeah, I was curious about um, was when you described how you um, did your statistical analysis, I was curious as to why 
you did uh, multiple pair T's as opposed to um, ANOVAs. Like how so since we're looking at this uh, same patient, pop uh, same patient, uh, we were looking at PBMCs and follicular cells uh, in the same patient at the same uh, TVOR appointment and determining just the difference between the two compartments, we decided to do a pair yeah, T. I, I, yeah, I guess my, cons my question is more about you have multiple um, outcomes from the same sample. Mm -hmm. And so how are you modifying um, the fact that you have multiple samples, multiple outcomes from the same sample and how that might actually affect your statistical analysis? Mm, I'm not considered that. Okay. You, you just may, you know, I don't know whether you've published any of this yet, but no, that could definitely come up in, um, in, a, in a review, a manuscript okay. review in terms of how you actually do your statistics with these samples. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I have, I have yes. a question. So, you know, these uh, changes that you're seeing, especially with the exhausted T cells, I think you were seeing in the follicular fluid, mm -hmm. there is increased number of exhausted T cells. That's something that we have seen, I think, in our ascites sample immune cells from ovarian cancer patients. So, and the question we always have is, is that because of factors in the ascites fluid, in your case, the follicular fluid, that is leading to that change where the T cells become more exhausted because of the factors or is it, are you, do you think it's because of actual trafficking of the exhausted T cells into the follicular fluid? I think it's more of a local pathology. So it's the factors. In the... Yeah. One other question. Yes. Yeah. Are you able to um, look at um, obese versus non-obese people? Yes, so we have uh, patients at diff all different weight points. Uh, so yes, we can. I mean, I have done some analysis on that as well, but uh, still preliminary. Okay, thank you, Shoma. So we go on to our last uh, talk, uh, that's by Kate Westerby. And so I'll just briefly introduce you, Kate. So Kate is currently doing a PhD. Um, uh, and so she's a grad student on campus. Uh, before that, she had finished her, she completed her master's in uh, psychology, applied psychology, and also a bachelor's in psychology. And she has held numerous positions on campus, uh, including in the Poverty Institute and has been a fellow uh, on a grant that was funded, I think, by the WPP, the Wisconsin Partnership Alliance. So we are happy to have you here and looking forward to your talk. I think you had uh, a partner, but they can't come. Uh, yes, she today. got COVID. She Tested got COVID, COVID, sorry. COVID two days ago. Oh, all right, no. sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. So thanks again for, I think I'm the social determinants of health presentation for the day. Um, so again, I'm a PhD candidate in educational leadership and policy analysis, and I'm part of the core lab. So that's my connection to you all. Um, Sinitra was my um, partner for this, and she tested positive for COVID, but she is a community co-researcher and undergrad. Um, so this research has grown out of our experiences being um, teen parents and trying to navigate challenging experiences and wanting better support and resources for other young parents. So the presentation is titled Using Participatory Action Research to Challenge the History of Young Parenthood. Um, so we aim to have you ponder this question today. Dr. Wanda Pillow, who is at the University of Utah, um, had this question, what type of education fits with the pregnant mothering body? And I added the word young to it because I think that is particularly important. And we'll provide some evidence that education and pregnancy and mothering are often at odds with each other, especially as it relates to young parents. So just defining young parents, um, we situate young parents in the broader group of caretakers um, and then parents underneath that. And young parents um, include teen parents, but it also overlaps with single parents, parents with young children, parents of color, which are all um, populations in the literature. Um, young parents are also um, relatively common, 
about 25% of each of births are to each year are to women 25 or 24 and younger. Um, it's also an equity issue. So um, young parents are more likely to have intersectional marginalized identities, um, more likely to be female, low income, racially and ethnically minoritized, and then first generation students as well. Um, and so I'm defining young parents as age 23 or less, um, given my data set, and then once a young parent, always a young parent. Um, and so this research is guided by reproductive justice principles that all fertile persons and persons who reproduce and become pregnant have basic human rights to have a child, not have a child, and or to parent their children in safe and healthy environments, um, regardless of age. And this um, framework was created in the mid-1990s by Sister Song Reproductive Justice Collective, an Atlanta-based Black-led activist group who challenges the choice framework that is in white-centric fem the feminist movement. Um, and they talk about pregnancy and childbearing are not really choice events um, for many people. They are certainly not events devoid of context of a history of eugenics, slavery, conservatism, religiosity, or interpersonal relationships. Um, reproductive justice approaches also um, require us to understand the history of a problem. So if we wanna to attend to the historical influences and in the social creation of the young parent problem, um, several policies and narratives influence our understanding. And I'll talk quickly about the teen parenting ep epidemic and then Dobbs versus Jackson um, narratives that occurred afterwards. Um, so in the 1970s, the Guttmacher Institute created a report that described the rates of teen childbirth as an epidemic and in partnership with Planned Parenthood wanted support for abortion rights by scapegoating young parents. What was interesting is that the um, birth rates for teenage parents were actually declining before this report. Still this narrative, um, scapegoating young parents has continued today after Dobbs versus Jackson. Uh, this narrative was prominent on social media. Here's an example of um, a meme that was describing young parents as unqualified and traumatized girls. And so they were saying that the Supreme Court should consider that in abortion rights. Um, the Personal Responsibility Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act of 1996 has also been influential. Um, it's also commonly referred to as welfare reform, and it includes an immense amount of discriminatory language and uses marriage to garner support for it that stigmatizes single parents. Um, in the middle section here, you can see that they imply that being born out of wedlock is causal to negative child outcomes. And you can also see in the final part of the bill, the valuing of vocational education training um, rather than a liberal arts education focus. Since the research study we're talking about um, is focusing on education, um, we focus on the education related aspects of this bill. Um, this bill importantly includes a 20 hour per week um, requirement to work in order to receive public assistance. Um, and states are allowed to decide what counts as work. And in Wisconsin is one example of a state that decided education does not count towards that requirement. And so for many young parents, they're, they have to work 20 hours per week to receive benefits. Um, they're trying to often work full time as full time students as well, um, because financial aid values being a full-time student, and then they have to manage childcare and navigating all the other systems as well that they have to navigate. Um, I'll finalize this with uh, stigmatizing research, just touching on some articles that have been published um, describing young parents as harsh, regretful, or at-risk groups, and these articles um, further deficit-based deficit narrative about young parents. So one approach that I'm using in my research um, is to use participatory action research. Um, and this framework shares power in the research process, including selecting the research topic, data collection analysis, and deciding what action should happen as a research of, or as a result of research findings. Um, the goal is to lead people, um, lead to people having increased control over their lives and it's action focused. So resulting in a project um, product or policy to change knowledge and improve practices and lives. So this is my research design, um, starting with quant analysis, analyzing educational outcomes for young parents and preparing data briefs. And then I'll show you an example of how I've used um, that in working with young parents and having them co-interpret the quantitative data with me. And then we're doing kind of a reciprocal cycle where they come up with their own research ideas and I go back to the data and present it to them. Um, and then they interpret it as well. So that's the cycle I'm in right now. The rest is um, ongoing. The ethnography is going into the IRB this 
summer and um, still doing some qualitative analysis that will lead to publications and presentations of policy briefs. So the questions that um, I'm asking are to what extent do young parents enroll and persist in post-secondary education? And then the next two questions are about young parents' interpretations of that data. Um, so how do they explain national enrollment and persistence in equities for young parents in post-secondary education? And what policy or structural recommendations do young parents have to address inequities? For research question one, I used the high school longitudinal study of 2009. This is a National Center for Education Statistics data set. It's a public data set um, that in 2009 surveyed um, ninth graders. And I used primarily that wave and then the wave of them um, around college when they were there after college, wave four. Um, and then these are the data placemats I'm using to engage other young parents. The goal is about 15 young parents. Um, I worked with three so far, but these are things that they um, have written on and taken time to really um, think about and help interpret um, these charts. So um, this is an example of some preliminary results. So you can see that if um, you were a young parent, um, they are less likely to have applied um, or registered for college than people who are not young parents. And this is approximately at age 23. Um, and then looking at ever attending college, they're um, by age 23, they are 41% less likely to have attended college um, at that age, which I think is an alarming statistic. Um, and when I asked the young moms I'm working with to interpret this, they said, I feel like the percentages are lower for us because they feel like we're a waste of resources or just a bunch of people don't believe in us because they think or they feel like we're not capable or they think we are going to get distracted when we will, but because there's not enough resources, like when it comes to childcare or not just childcare, but support for the mother too, because unlike other college students, we have more responsibilities and they're bigger, way bigger responsibilities, deeper responsibilities. And a lot of people don't realize that. Um, looking at college persistence, you can see that this is about measured about three years after high school um, and young parents are most likely to be um, unenrolled and have no degree. Um, and then, so that's 55% compared to 22%. And when looking at four-year colleges, which ties back to the Welfare Reform Act, where they're pushing more vocational focused um, jobs, you can see the difference in young parents um, being enrolled at a four-year college compared to those who are not young parents. And when asked about this, um, the young parents said, because I feel like it's not just the money-wise, it's like the mental too, because obviously going through college itself is super stressful. Now with a kid on top, it's even more because having a kid doesn't mean that you're just dealing with the kid, you're dealing with financial issues, you're dealing with baby daddy stuff, their family stuff, not just your own family, but the other partner's family, you're dealing with, you know, what am I going to cook today? because I have class and I don't have time to cook or who's gonna watch her because the daycare canceled today so I can't make it to class or like I need to be, I'm going to spend an extra hour after class because I need to do this project or something like that. And you can't because you have a kid. Like finding childcare for your classes itself, it's already hard enough to be finding childcare for extra stuff. Like if you need a tutor, who's gonna watch my kid while I do my work? You know, it's not just the financial part but it's also like the mental stuff. You go through so much. Like if my kid gets sick, I'm not sick myself. So what if they don't take that as an excuse for me to not be able to miss out? Um, so just wrapping up kind of what we're doing now. So we have this young parent research collective group where they help co-interpret different types of data, provide recommendations, policy research. And we're presenting tomorrow at the American Educational Research Association online. Um, so it'll be myself and a group of young moms and some researchers who focus on this. And the um, idea is to have this, these policy recommendations and briefs um, really led by young parents. So just to leave us with that initial question, what type of education fits with the young pregnant mothering body? Um, it's clear that education is often at odds with reproductive justice and more needs to be done to create accessible and financially stable pathways for young parents. Questions? There's one in the chat. So there is one in the chat, Kate. Uh, thanks for this presentation. I have a question about some of the terminology around the RGA framework. I'm wondering why you choose to limit the def definition of RGA as applying only to fertile people and what some of the implications of limiting the framework in this way might have. 
It's a great question, Lee. Um, so I'm using a 2018 definition um, from the Ross and Sollinger book, and that's the definition they've used. And so it's probably, it has changed some since then. Um, but I think um, limiting to fertile people is a conversation I had with a woman who, um, it does have implications for education, especially too, because a lot of people choose not, or choose, or, you know, are trying to plan their their um, work and education around having children. And so um, that includes men too, right? And um, being unfertile. So it's something I have to think about um, and I'll review some of their recent definitions too. But I think that a lot of people have to think about having having children and reproductive justice is um, you know, one, one approach and that is a definition that they've used before. So thanks Lee. That was a great talk. Um, and I think you just demonstrated and illustrated what we call structured disparities. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is a structure that's been created that really has an impact not only on one generation, but multiple generations when we think about generational wealth. Yeah. And so I, I applaud you for doing this and, and for helping to educate the rest of us about how success can occur. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Thanks for visiting our department and sharing your work with us. I had one nuts and bolts question and one broader question. The nuts and bolts, I'm curious, are you meeting, in terms of this style of participatory research, are you meeting with parents individually and like, how are you finding them? Or are there times when you're meeting with them as a group? So I was just curious about that. And the second is, you've got this group here of people who, who take care of teen parents or young parents and or um, young expecting parents and I was wondering if there's any wisdom that you wanted to impart to them or maybe channeling also your your partner who's not here today so those are my two thoughts questions Thank for you you um so I work with a local um, program at MMSD is how I've met a lot of I volunteer there and started volunteering there I'm not going in saying like I'm going to do research but i um, waiting to see if something occurred from that and so um have created just partnerships with the moms who have graduated. And so the data I've collected already is from essentially two different focus groups with three of the moms who graduated last year. And so um, they're moms who I've just developed a relationship with and I check in on them every once in a while and try to help them with things that they need. And they also, you know, help me with my research. And, um, and so that's been really, um, just an amazing experience, right? Young people are fun. They're creative. They have like such great energy and you lose that as you get older, I feel like in my experience. Um, and so they're, they're just really great to work with. They have great ideas. They're, um, and they're, they're fun to work with in research. And so, um, so working with them is great. I think I'm seeing a lot of, um, when I work with the moms, I tend to work with them on their graduation portfolios. And more often than not, most of them say like my future goal is to have financial stability. And so they're just dealing with so much, um, so many different factors, you know, where we have a huge rent and housing issue in Madison, um, rent is super high and they leave high school and they're trying to figure out what to do often and trying to manage work and childcare and all these things. Um, it can be really challenging, but financial stability is important. I think there are some um, guaranteed income um, research areas that I think would be really interesting to work with young parents on. I think um, educational um, FAFSA and um, different cost of attendance policies could be helpful for young parents too, for thinking about policy um, initiatives. But working with young parents is, is great. I think um, just letting them lead the process is important too. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of saviorism that can come out when you're working with community groups. And so um, being cognizant of like, you know, that they still have agency to make their own choices and you're there to support what, what you can. Yeah. I have a question, uh, yeah. Kate. So uh, maybe I missed it in your talk, uh, but when you, when you were showing numbers of like the college completion rates, uh, do you have uh, data on where you compare the socioeconomic status and how that you know w works out with those numbers? Like, um, um, I have not disaggregated 
those outcomes yet by that, but I do know that the young parents in the sample, 18% um, of young parents are low income, but 30% of young parents are um, at the poverty threshold, I, I should say, not low income. Um, so that they are more likely to be low income. But one of the questions that the moms asked, um, one of the research questions was, do young parents have family support? And there were three different um, questions in the research that covered this. And um, the disparities in that are also large, that young parents um, are less likely to have financial or parental financial support for um, room and board, so for housing, than people who are not young parents. And so I do, um, I did disaggregate that data by that and found that um, people who do attend college do have more parental support um, who are young parents, if that makes sense, yeah. Thank you so much for doing this work. It's really interesting and important. You talked about policy briefs and publications and presentations. I'm wondering about your um, community partners' ideas about how else to disseminate your findings um, as well as elevating the, the wisdom that they bring. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And something that we haven't gotten to yet in where we're at in the research process um, I really want to, to ask them this and to help them, um, to have them like lead this process. Um, we do have some connections with legislators too, where it might be, um, you know, going to meet them and, and see them. And I think that could be a cool opportunity, but, um, still TBD and they'll, um, they'll get a say on, in that part of it too. Thanks. Oh, um, we got that one. One more. Um, thank you so much, Kate, for this. I just really appreciate it. And it it, it, it makes me quiet um, because there are so many uh, challenges and it's just, um, and it's wonderful to know that that, that people like you um, are, 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 are working on these types of inequity issues. Uh, it makes me proud of the department and, and core. And, um, and so I just wanted to make that comment. And I also wanted to congratulate all of the presenters this morning, because to me, this is a reflection of the depth and breadth of the research that's going on in the department. So um, yeah, thank you so very much. So um, can I give the closing remarks? Well, I think Ellen wrapped that up nicely. I was just gonna say on behalf of our chair and our department, thank you for everyone for participating. I think uh, working with Manish has been great. We hope to just continue to diversify what we're representing in our department and thanks for all contributing to its success.